The celebrated John Bunyan was born about 400 years ago, in a small village called Elston, near Bedford, which is about 50 miles north of London. In one of his works, he has given a considerably minute account of his early life, so that we are enabled to give our readers the narrative of his conversion nearly in his own words. The account is addressed to his children, his history before his conversion. And this my relation of the merciful working of God upon my soul, says he, it will not be amiss, if, in the first place, I do, in a few words, give you a hint of my pedigree and manner of bringing up, that thereby the goodness and bounty of God towards me may be the more advanced and magnified before the sons of men. For my descent, then, it was, as is well known to many, of a low, inconsiderable generation, my father's house being of that rank that is meanest and most despised of all the families in the land. Wherefore, I have not here, as others, to boast of noble blood or of any high-born state, according to the flesh, though all things considered, I magnify the heavenly majesty, for that by this door he brought me into this world, to partake of the grace and life that is in Christ by the gospel. But yet, notwithstanding the meanness and inconsiderableness of my parents, it pleased God to put it into their hearts to put me to school, to learn both to read and to write, the which I also attain, according to the rate of the poor men's children. Though to my shame I confess, I did soon lose that little I learnt, even almost utterly, and that long before the Lord did work his gracious work of conversion upon my soul. As for my own natural life, for the time that I was without God in the world, it was, indeed, according to the course of this world, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It was my delight to be taken captive by the devil at his will, being filled with all unrighteousness, the which also did so strongly work and put forth itself, both in my heart and life, and that from a child, that I had but few equals for cursing, swearing, lying, and blaspheming the holy name of God. Yea, so settled and rooted was I in these things, that they became as a second nature to me, the which, as I have with soberness considered since, did so offend the Lord, that even in my childhood he did scare and affright me with fearful dreams, and did terrify me with fearful visions. For often, after I have spent this and the other day in sin, I have in my bed been greatly afflicted, while asleep, with the apprehensions of wicked spirits, who still as I then thought, labored to draw me away with them, of which I could never be rid. Also I was during these years, greatly afflicted and troubled with the thoughts of the fearful torments of hell fire, still fearing, that it would be my lot to be found at last among those who are bound down with the chains and bonds of darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. These things I say, when I was but a child, but nine or ten years old, did so distress my soul, that then in the midst of my many sports and childish vanities, amidst my vain companions, I was often much cast down, and afflicted in my mind therewith, yet could I not let go my sins. A while after those terrible dreams did leave me, which also I soon forgot, for my pleasures did quickly cut off the remembrance of them, as if they had never been. Wherefore with more greediness, according to the strength of nature, I did still let loose the reins of my lust, and delighted in all transgressions against the law of God, so that I was the very ringleader of all the youth that kept me company, in all manner of vice and ungodliness. Yea, such prevalency had the lusts, and fruits of the flesh on this poor soul of mine, that had not a miracle of precious grace prevented, I had not only perished by the stroke of eternal justice, but had also laid myself open even to the stroke of those laws which bring some to disgrace and open shame before the face of the world. In those days, the thought of religion was very grievous to me. I could neither endure it myself, nor that any other should, so that when I have seen some read in those books that concern Christian piety, it would be as it were a prison to me. Then I said unto God, Depart from me, for I desire not the knowledge of thy ways. I was now void of all good consideration, heaven and hell were both out of sight and mind, and as for saving and damning, they were least in my thoughts. O Lord, Thou knowest my life, and my ways were not hid from Thee. That God did not utterly leave me, but followed me still, not with convictions, but judgments, yet such as were mixed with mercy. For once I fell into a creek of the sea, and hardly escaped drowning. 
Another time I fell out of a boat into Bedford River, but Mercy yet preserved me alive. Besides, another time, being in the field with one of my companions, it chanced that an adder passed over the highway, so I, having a stick in my hand, struck her over the back. And having stunned her, I forced open her mouth with my stick, and plucked her tongue out with my fingers. Be which act, had not God been merciful unto me, I might, by my desperateness, have brought myself to my end. This also, I have taken notice of, with thanksgiving. When I was a soldier, I, with others, was drawn out to go to a certain place, to besiege it. But when I was just ready to go, one of the company desired to go in my room, to which when I consented, he took my place, and coming to the siege, as he stood sentinel, he was shot in the head with a musket bullet, and died. Here, as I said, were judgments and mercy, but neither of them did awaken my soul to righteousness, wherefore I sinned still, and grew more and more rebellious against God, and careless of my own salvation. Presently after this I changed my condition into a married state, and my mercy to light upon a wife whose father was counted godly. This woman and I though we came together as poor as poor might be, not having so much household stuff as a dish or spoon betwixt us both, yet this she had for her part, the plain man's pathway to heaven, and the practice of piety, which her father had left her when he died. In these two books I would sometimes read with her, wherein I also found some things that were somewhat pleasing to me, but all this while I met with no conviction. She also would be often telling me what a godly man her father was, and how he would reprove and correct vice, both in his house and among his neighbors, and what a strict and holy life he lived in his days, both in word and deeds. Wherefore these books, with the relation, though they did not reach my heart to awaken it about my sad and sinful state, yet they did beget within me some desires to reform my vicious life, and fall in very eagerly with the religion of the times, to wit, to go to church twice a day, and that too with the foremost. And there, I would be very devout, and both say and sing as others did, yet I retain my wicked life. But without, I was so overrun with the spirit of superstition that I adored, and that with great devotion, even all things belonging to the church, the high place, priest, clerk, vestment, service, counting all things holy that were therein contained, and especially the priest and clerk most happy, and without doubt, greatly blessed, because they were the servants, as I then thought, of God, and were principally in the holy temple to do his work therein. But all this while I was not sensible of the danger and evil of sin, I was kept from considering that sin would damn me. What religion soever I followed, unless I was found in Christ, nay, I never thought of him, nor whether there was such a one or no. Thus man, while blind, doth wander, but wearieth himself with vanity, for he knoweth not the way to the city of God. But one day, amongst all the sermons our parson made, his subject was to treat of the Sabbath day and of the evil of breaking that, either with labor, sports, or otherwise. Now I was, notwithstanding my religion, one that took much delight in all manner of vice, and especially, that was the day that I did solace myself therewith. Wherefore I fell in my conscience under this sermon, thinking and believing that he made that sermon of purpose to show me my evil doing. And at that time I felt what guilt was, though never before that I can remember. But then I was, for the present, greatly laden therewith, and so went home when the sermon was ended, with a great burden upon my spirit. This, for that instant, did benumb the sinews of my best delights, and did embitter my former pleasures to me. But it lasted not, for before I had well dined, the trouble began to go off my mind, and my heart returned to my old course. But oh, how glad was I that this trouble was gone from me and that the fire was put out, that I might sin again without control. Wherefore when I had satisfied nature with my food, I shook the sermon out of my mind, and to my old custom of sports and gaming, I returned with great delight. But the same day, as I was in the midst of a game of cat, and having struck it one blow from the hole, just as I was about to strike it a second time, a voice did suddenly dart from heaven into my soul, which said, Wilt thou leave thy sins and go to heaven or have thy sins and go to hell? At this I was put to an exceeding amazed wherefore, 
Leaving my cat upon the ground, I looked up to heaven, and was as if I had, with the eyes of my understanding, seen the Lord Jesus looking down upon me, as being very hotly displeased with me, and as if he did severely threaten me with some grievous punishment for these and other ungodly practices. I had no sooner thus conceived in my mind, but suddenly this conclusion was fastened on my spirit, that I had been a great and grievous sinner, and that it was now too late for me to look after heaven, for Christ would not forgive me, nor pardon my transgressions. Then I fell to musing on this also, and while I was thinking of it, and fearing lest it should be so, I felt my heart sink in despair, concluding it was too late, and therefore I resolved in my mind to go on in sin, for, thought I, if the case be thus, my state is surely miserable, miserable if I leave my sins, and but miserable if I follow them, I can but be damned, and if I must be so, I had as good be damned for many sins, as damned for few. Thus I stood in the midst of my place before all that then were present, but yet I told them nothing. But I say, having made this conclusion, I return desperately to my sport again, and I well remember that presently this kind of despair did so possess my soul, that I was persuaded I could never attain to other comfort than what I could get in sin, for heaven was gone already so that on that I must not think. Wherefore, I found within me great desire to take my fill of sin, still studying what sin was yet to be committed, that I might taste the sweetness of it, and I made as much haste as I could to fill my belly with its delicacies, lest I should die before I had my desires, for that I feared greatly. In these things I protest before God, I lie not, neither do I frame this sort of speech, these were heavy, strongly, and with all my heart, my desires. The good Lord, whose mercy is unsearchable, forgive my transgressions. And I am more confident that this temptation of the devil is more usual among poor creatures than many are aware of, even to overrun the spirits with a seared frame of heart and benumbing of conscience, which frame he stilly and slyly supplieth with such despair, that, though not much guilt attendeth such, yet they have continually a secret conclusion within them. That there is no hope for them, for they have loved sins, therefore after them they will go. But thou saidst, there is no hope, no, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. And they said, there is no hope, but we will walk every one after our own devices, and we will every one do the imagination of his evil heart. Now, therefore, I went on in sin with great greediness of mind, still grudging that I could not be satisfied with it as I would. This did continue with me about a month or more, but one day as I was standing by a neighbor's shop window, and there cursing and swearing and playing the madman after my wanted manner, there sat within the woman of the house and heard me, who though she was a very loose, ungodly wretch, yet protested I swore and cursed at that most fearful rate that she was made to tremble to hear me, and told me further that I was the ungodliest fellow for swearing she ever heard in all her life, and that I by thus doing was able to spoil all the youth in the whole town if they came but in my company. At this reproof, I was silenced and put to secret shame, and that too, as I thought, before the God of heaven, wherefore while I stood there, and hanging down my head, I wished with all my heart that I might be a little child again, that my father might teach me to speak without this wicked way of swearing. For, thought I, I am so accustomed to it, that it is in vain for me to think of a reformation, for I thought that could never be. But how it came to pass I know not, I did from that time forward so leave my swearing, that it was a great wonder to myself to observe it, and whereas before I knew not how to speak, unless I put an oath before and another behind, to make my words have authority, now I could, without it, speak better and with more pleasantness than ever I could before. All this while I knew not Jesus Christ, neither did leave my sports and plays. But quickly after this, I fell into company with one poor man who made profession of religion, who, as I then thought, did talk pleasantly of the scriptures and of the matter of religion, wherefore falling into some love and liking to what he said, I betook me to the Bible and began to take great pleasure in rending, and especially the historical part thereof. For as for Paul's epistles, and such like scriptures, I could not away with them, being as yet ignorant either of the corruptions of my nature or of the want and worth of Jesus Christ to save us. 
Wherefore I fell to some outward reformation both in him words and life, and did set the commandments before me for my way to heaven, which commandments I also did strive to keep, and, as I thought, did keep them pretty well sometimes, and then I would have comfort, yet now and then would break one, and so afflict my conscience, but then I would repent, and say I was sorry for it, and promise God to do better next time, and there got help again, for then I thought I pleased God as well as any man in England. Thus I continued about a year, all which time our neighbors did take me to be a very godly man, a new and religious man, and did marvel much to see such great and famous alteration in my life and manners. Deed so it was, though I knew not Christ, nor grace, nor faith, nor hope, for as I have well since seen, had I then died, my state had been most fearful. But, I say, my neighbors marveled at this my great conversion from prodigious profaneness to something like a moral life, and truly, so they might. Now therefore they began to praise, to commend, and to speak well of me, both to my face and behind my back. Now I was, as they said, become godly, now I was become a right honest man. But oh, when I understood those were their words and opinions of me, it pleased me mighty well. For though as yet I was nothing but a poor painted hypocrite, yet I loved to be talked of as one that was truly godly. I was proud of my godliness, and indeed, I did all I did either to be seen, or to be well spoken of by men, and thus I continued for about a twelve month or more. All this while, when I thought I kept this or that commandment, or did by word or deed, anything that I thought was good, I had great peace in my conscience, and would think with myself, God cannot choose but be now pleased with me, yea, to relate it in my own word, I thought no man in England could please God better than I. But poor wretch as I was, I was all this well ignorant of Jesus Christ, and going about to establish my own righteousness, and had perished therein, had not God, in mercy, showed me more of my state. By this narrative we are most forcibly taught, that there is no real pleasure in the ways of sin. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked, the way of transgressors is hard. Sin promises pleasures, but yields only pain, honor, bad it leads to disgrace, happiness, but it tends to misery. This Bunyan found. He made himself crooked ways, and while he walked in them, he was getting farther and farther from God, from purity, from felicity, from heaven. So also, convictions of sin may be felt by those who love it and wish not to part with it, and though there may be a reformation of conduct, yet there may be no change of heart. All who properly consider the character of Bunyan must be convinced of the necessity of a change in his heart and life in order to his being made fit for heaven and a suitable companion for the spirits of the just made perfect. The disparity is so great between purity and depravity that we ask, how can two walk together except they be agreed? And knowing that God is immutable in his nature, in his law, and also in his threatenings to enforce its penalties, we naturally infer that a change must take place in the sinner. That is, he is dead in trespasses and sins, and walking according to the course of this world, being led captive by the devil at his will, if ever his mind be changed, and he pursues heavenly and divine objects, it must be through the power of the Holy Spirit by whom he is created anew in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that he should walk in them. This gracious change Bunyan did at length experience, the manner in which it was accomplished, and the effects produced by it, he himself relates his conversion. Upon a day, the good providence of God called me to Bedford, to work at my calling, and in one of the streets of that town, I came where there were three or four poor women sitting at the door, in the sun, talking about the things of God, and being now willing to hear their discourse, I drew near to hear what they said, for I was now a brisk talker of myself, in the matters of religion, but I may say I heard but understood not, for they were far above out of my reach. Their talk was about a new birth, the work of God in their hearts, as also how they were convinced of their miserable state by nature. They talked how God had visited their souls with his love in the Lord Jesus, and with what words and promises they had been refreshed, comforted and supported against the temptations of the devil. Moreover, they reasoned of the suggestions and temptations of Satan in particular, and told to each other by what means they had been afflicted, and how they were borne up under his assaults. 
They also discoursed of their own wretchedness of heart, and of their unbelief, and did contemn, slight and abhor their own righteousness, as filthy and insufficient to do them any good. And men thought they spake as if joy did make them speak. They spake with such pleasantness of scripture language, and with appearance of grace in all they say, that they were to me as if they had found a new world, as if they were people that dwelt alone, and were not to be reckoned among their neighbors. At this I felt my own heart began to shake, and mistrust my condition to be not, for I saw that in all my thoughts about religion and salvation, the new birth had never entered into my mind. Neither knew I the comfort of the word of promise, nor the deceitfulness and treachery of my own wicked heart. As for secret thoughts, I took no notice of them, neither did I understand what Satan's temptations were, nor how they were to be withstood and resisted. Thus, therefore, when I had heard and considered what they said, I left them and went about my employment again. But their talk and discourse went with me, also my heart would tarry with them, for I was greatly affected with their words, both because by them I was convinced that I wanted the true tokens of a truly godly man, and also because by them I was convinced of the blessed and happy condition of him that was such a one. Therefore, I would often make it my business to be going again and again into the company of these poor people, for I could not stay away, and the more I went among them, the more did I question my condition. And as I still do remember, presently I found two things within me, at which I did sometimes marvel, especially considering what a blind, ignorant, sordid and ungodly wretch but just before I was. The one was a very great softness and tenderness of heart which caused me to fall under the conviction of what by scripture they asserted, and the other was a great bending in my mind, to a continual meditating on it, and on all other good things, which at any time I heard, or read of. By these things my mind was now so turned to, and fixed upon eternity, and on the things about the kingdom of heaven, that so far as I know, though as yet, God knows, I knew but little, neither pleasure, nor profits, nor persuasions, nor threats, could loose it, or make it let go its hold, and though I may speak it with shame. Yet it is in very deed a certain truth, it would then have been as difficult for me to have taken my mind from heaven to earth, as I have often found it since, to get again from earth to heaven. One thing I may not omit, there was a young man in our town, to whom my heart before was knit more than to any other, but he being a most wicked creature for cursing and swearing, and lewdness, I now shook him off, and forsook his company. But about a quarter of a year after I had left him, I met him in a certain lane, and asked him how he did, he, after his old swearing and mad word, answered he was well. But Harry, said I, why do you curse and swear thus I what will become of you, if you die in this condition? He answered me in a great anger. Bunyan about this time met with books written by some enthusiastic men of his day, who lived to disgrace their profession. He says, some of these I read, but was not able to make any judgment about them. Therefore, as I read in them, and thought upon them, seeing myself unable to judge, I would betake myself to hearty prayer in this manner, O Lord, I am a fool, and not able to know the truth from error, Lord, leave me not to my own blindness, either to approve of or condemn this doctrine, if it be of God, let me not despise it, if it be of the devil, let me not embrace it. Lord, I lay my soul in this matter only at thy foot, let me not be deceived, I humbly beseech thee. These people would also talk to me of their ways, and condemn me as legal and dark, pretending that they only had attained to perfection, that they could do what they would, and not sin. Though, these temptations were suitable to my flesh, I being but a young man, and my nature in its prime, but God, who had, as I hoped, designed me for better things, kept me in the fear of his name, and did not suffer me to accept of such a cursed principle. And blessed be God, who put it into my heart to cry to him to be kept and directed, still distrusting my own wisdom. For I have seen even the effects of that prayer, in his preserving me, not only from these errors, but from those also that have sprung up since. The Bible was precious to me in those days. And now, my thought, I began to look into the Bible with new eyes, and read as I never did before, and especially the epistles of the Apostle Paul were sweet and pleasant to me, and indeed then I was never out of the Bible, either by reading or meditation, still crying out to God, that I might know the truth and way to heaven and glory. About this time, the state and happiness of these poor people at Bedford was thus, in a kind of vision, presented to me. 
I saw as if they were on the sunny side of some high mountain. They're refreshing themselves with the pleasant beams of the sun. While I was shivering and shrinking in the cold, afflicted with frost, snow, and dark clouds, my thought also, betwixt me and them, I saw a wall that did compass about this mountain. Now through this wall my soul did greatly desire to pass, concluding that if I could, I would even go into the very midst of them, and there also comfort myself with the heat of their sun. About this wall I bethought myself to go again and again, still prying as I went, to see if I could find some way or passage by which I might enter therein. But none could I find for some time. At the last, I saw, as it were, a narrow gap, like a little doorway in the wall, through which I attempted to pass. Now the passage being very straight and narrow, I made many efforts to get in, but all in vain, even until I was well nigh quite beat out, by striving to get in, at last, with great striving, my thought I did at first get in my head, and after that, by a sidelong striving, my shoulders, and then my whole body, then I was exceeding glad, went and sat down in the midst of them, and so was comforted with the light and heat of their sun. But as yet I could not attain to any comfortable persuasion that I had faith in Christ. But instead of having satisfaction here, I began to find my soul to be assaulted with fresh doubts about my future happiness, especially with such as these, whether I was elected, and whether the day of grace might not now be past and gone. By these two temptations I was very much afflicted and disquieted, sometimes by one, and sometimes by the other of them. And first to speak about my questioning my election, I found at this time, that though I was in a flame to find the way to heaven and glory, and though nothing could beat me off from this, yet this question did so offend and discourage me, that I was, especially, sometimes, as if the very strength of my body also had been taken away by the force and power thereof. This scripture did also seem to me to trample upon all my desires. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, that of God that showeth mercy. With this scripture I could not tell what to do, for I thought that unless the great God, of his infinite grace and bounty, had voluntarily chosen me to be a vessel of mercy, though I should desire, and long, and labor until my heart did break, no good could come of it. Therefore this would stick with me. How can you tell that you are elected? And what if you should not? How then, O Lord, thought I, what if I should not indeed? It may be you are not, said the tempter. It may be so indeed, thought I. Why, then, said Satan, you had as good leave off, and strive no farther, for if indeed you should not be elected and chosen of God, there is no hope of your being saved, for it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. By these things I was driven to my wit's end, not knowing what to say, or how to answer these temptations. Indeed, I little thought that Satan had thus assaulted me, but that rather it was my own prudence thus to start the question. For that the elect only obtained eternal life, that I without scruple heartily closed without, I thought I was sure, but that I myself was one of them, there lay the question. Thus, for several days, I was greatly assaulted and perplexed, and was often, when I have been walking, ready to sink where I went, with faintness in mind. But one day, after I had been so many weeks oppressed and cast down therewith, as I was now quite giving up the ghost of all my hopes of ever attaining life, that sentence fell with weight upon my spirit. Look at the generations of old and see, did ever any trust in God and were confounded. At this I was greatly enlightened, and encouraged in my soul. For thus, at that very instant, it was expounded to me, begin at the beginning of Genesis, and read to the end of the Revelation, and see if you can find that there were ever any that trusted in the Lord and were confounded. So coming home I presently went to my Bible, to see if I could find that saying, not doubting but to find it presently, for it was so fresh, and with such strength and comfort on my spirit, that it was as if it talked with me. When I looked, but I found it not, only it abode upon me. Thus I continued above a year, and could not find the place, but at last, casting my eye upon the apocryphal books, I found it in Ecclesiastics, look at the generations of old and see, did ever any trust in the Lord and was confounded, or did any abide in his fear and was forsaken I or whom did he ever despise that called upon him? This at the first did somewhat daunt me, but because by this time I had got more experience of the love and kindness of God, 
It troubled me less, especially when I considered that though it was not in those texts that we call holy and canonical, Yet for as much as this sentence was the sum and substance of many of the promises, it was my duty to take the comfort of it, and I bless God for that word, for it was of good to me, that word doth still oft times shine before my face. After this, that other doubt did come with strength upon me, but how if the day of grace should be past and gone? How if you have overstood the day of mercy? Now I remember that one day as I was walking in the country, I was much in the thoughts of this. But how if the day of grace is past? And to aggravate my trouble, the tempter presented to my mind those good people of Bedford, and suggested this unto me, that these being converted already, they were all that God would save in those parts, and that I came too late, for these had got the blessing before I came. Now I was in great distress, thinking in very deed that this might well be so. Wherefore I went up and down, bemoaning my sad condition, counting myself far worse than a thousand fools, for standing off thus long, and spending so many years in sin as I had done, still crying out, though that I had turned sooner, oh that I had turned seven years ago. It made me also angry with myself to think that I should have no more wit, but to trifle away my time, till my soul and heaven were lost. But when I had been long vexed with this fear, and was scarce able to take one step more, just about the same place where I received my other encouragement. These words broken upon my mind, compel them to come in that my house may be filled, and so there is room. These words, but especially and yet there is room, were sweet words to me, for truly I thought that by them I saw there was place enough in heaven for me, and moreover, that when the Lord Jesus did speak these words, he then did think of me, and that he knowing that the lime would come, that I should be afflicted with fear, that there was no place left for me in his bosom, did before speak this word, and leave it upon record, that I might find help thereby against this vile temptation. This I then verily believed. In the light and encouragement of this word I went for some time, and the comfort was the more, when I thought that the Lord Jesus should think on me so long ago, and that he should speak those words on purpose for my sake, for I did think verily that he did on purpose speak them to encourage me withal. But I was not without my temptations to go back again. Temptations, I say, both from Satan, mine own heart, and carnal acquaintance. But I thank God these were outweighed by that sound sense of death, and of the day of judgment, which abode as it were, continually in my view. I would often also think of Nebuchadnezzar of whom it is said, he had given him all the kingdoms of the earth, and for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages, trembled and feared before him, whom he would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. Yet, thought I, if this great man had all his portion in this world, one hour in hell would make him forget all, which consideration was a great help to me. I found by the word, that those that must be glorified with Christ in another world, must be called by him here, called to the partaking of a share in his word and righteousness, and to the comforts and first fruits of his spirit, and to a peculiar interest in all those heavenly things, which do indeed prepare the soul for that rest and house of glory, which is in heaven above. Here again I was at a very stand, not knowing what to do, fearing I was not called, for, thought I, if I be not called, what then can do me good? None but those who are effectually called inherit the kingdom of heaven. But oh how I now love those words which spake of a Christian's calling, as when the Lord said to one, Follow me, and to another, Come after me, and oh, thought I, that he would say this to me too, how gladly would I run after him I, I cannot now express with what longings and breathings in my soul I cried to Christ to call me. Thus, I continued for a time all on a flame to be converted to Jesus Christ, and did also see at that day such glory in a converted state that I could not be contented without a share therein. Gold, could it have been gotten for gold? What would I have given for it? Had I the whole world, it had all gone ten thousand times over for this, that my soul might have been in a converted state. How lovely now was every one in my eyes that I thought to be converted, whether man or woman. They shone, they walked like a people that carried the broad seal of heaven about them. Oh, I saw the lot was fall into them in pleasant places, and they had a goodly heritage. But that which made me sick, was what Christ said in St. Mark. He went up into a mountain, and called to him whom he would, and they came unto him. This scripture made me faint in fear, 
yet it kindled fire in my soul. That which made me fear was this, lest Christ should have no liking to me, for he called whom he would. But oh the glory that I saw in that condition did so engage my heart that I could seldom read of any that Christ did call, but I presently wished, would I had been in their clothes, would I had been born Peter, would I had been born John, or would I had been by and heard him when he called them, how would I have cried, O oh Lord, call me also. But, oh, I feared he would not call me, and truly, the Lord let me go thus many months together, and showed me nothing, either that I was already, or should be called hereafter, but at last after much time spent, and many groans to God that I might be made partaker of the holy and heavenly calling. That word came in upon me, I will cleanse their blood, that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. These words I thought were sent to encourage me to wait still upon God and signified unto me, that if I were not already, the time might come, when I might be in truth converted unto Christ. About this time I began to break my mind to those poor people in Bedford, and to tell them my condition, which when they had heard, they told Mr. Gifford of me, who himself also took occasion to talk with me, and was willing to be well persuaded of me, though I think from little grounds. But he invited me to his house, where I should hear him confer with others about the dealings of God with their souls, from all which I still received more conviction, and from that time began to see something of the vanity and inward wretchedness of my wicked heart, for as yet I knew no great matter therein. But now it began to be discovered unto me, and also to work at that rate as it never did before. Now I evidently found that lusts and corruptions put forth themselves within me in wicked thoughts and desires, which I did not regard before, my desires also for life and heaven began to fail. I found also that whereas before my soul was full of longing after God, now it began to hanker after every foolish vanity, Yea, my heart would not be moved to mind that which was good. It began to be careless. Both of my soul and heaven, it would now continually hang back, both to, and in every duty, and was as a clog on the leg of a bird, to hinder it from flying. Yea, I thought now I grew worse and worse. Now I am farther from conversion than I ever was before, wherefore I began to entertain such discouragement in my heart, as laid me low as hell. If now I should have burned at the stake, I could not believe that Christ had a love for me. Alas, I could neither hear him, nor see him, nor feel him, nor savor any of his things. I was driven as with a tempest, my heart would be unclean, and the Canaanites would dwell in the land. Sometimes I would tell my condition to the people of God, which when they heard they would pity me, and would tell me of the promises. But they had as good have told me that I must reach the sun with my finger, as have bidden me receive or rely upon the promises, and as soon I should have done it. All my sense and feeling were against me, and I saw I had a heart that would sin, and that lay under a law that would condemn. These things have often made me think of the child which the father brought to Christ, who while he was yet coming to him, was thrown down by the devil, and also so rent and torn by him, that he lay, and wallowed, foaming. Farther in these days, I would find my heart shut itself up against the Lord and against his holy word. I have found my unbelief to set, as it were, the shoulder to the door, to keep him out, and that too, even then, when I have with many a bitter sigh cried, Good Lord, break it open. Lord, break these gates of brass, and cut these bars of iron asunder. But all this while, as to the act of sinning, I was never more tender than now, I durst not take a pin or stick, though but so big as a straw, for my conscience now was sore, and would smart at every touch. I could not now tell how to speak my words, for fear I should misplace them. Oh how cautiously did T then go, in all I did or said. I found myself as in a miry bog that shook if I did but stir, and was, as there, left both of God, and Christ, and the Spirit, and all good things. But I observed, though I was such a great sinner before conversion, yet God never much charged the guilt of the sins of my ignorance upon me, only he showed me I was lost if I had not Christ because I had been a sinner. I saw that I wanted a perfect righteousness to present me without fault before God. And this righteousness was nowhere to be found, but in the person of Jesus Christ. But my original and inward pollution, that, that was my plague and affliction, that I saw at a dreadful rate, always putting forth itself within me, that I had the guilt of to amazement, by reason of that, 
I was more loathsome in mine own eyes than a toad, and I thought I was so in God's eyes too. Sin and corruption, I said, would as naturally bubble out of my heart as water would out of a fountain. I thought that everyone had a better heart than I had. I could have changed hearts with anybody. I thought none, but the devil himself could equal me for inward wickedness and pollution of mine. I fell therefore at the sight of my own vileness deeply into despair, for I concluded that this condition that I was in could not stand with a state of grace. Sure thought I, I am forsaken of God, sure I am given up to the devil and to a reprobate mind, and thus I continued a long while, even for some years together. While I was thus afflicted with the fears of my own damnation, there were two things which would make me wonder. The one was, when I saw old people hunting after the things of this life, as if they should live here always. The other was, when I found professors much distressed and cast down, when they met with outward losses, as of husband, wife, child, etc. Lord, thought I, what ado is here about such little things as these? What seeking after carnal things, by some, and what grief in others for the loss of them? If they so much labor after, and shed so many tears for the things of this present life, how am I to be bemoaned, pitied, and prayed for? My soul is dying, my soul is damning. Were my soul but in a good condition, and were I but sure of it, ah how rich should I esteem myself, though blessed but with bread and water. I should count those but small afflictions, and should bear them as little burdens. A wounded spirit who can bear. And though I was much troubled and tossed and afflicted, with the sight and sense and terror of my own wickedness, yet I was afraid to let this sight and sense go quite off my mind, for I found that unless guilt of conscience was taken off the right way, that is by the blood of Christ, a man grew rather worse for the loss of his trouble of mind. Wherefore if my sense of guilt lay hard upon me, then would I cry that the blood of Christ might take it off, and if it was going off without it, for the sense of sin would be sometimes as if it would die, and go quite away. Then I would also strive to fetch it upon my heart again, by bringing the punishment of sin and hellfire upon my spirits, and would cry, Lord, let it not go off my heart, but the right way, by the blood of Christ, and the application of thy mercy through him to my soul, for this scripture did lay much upon me, without shedding of blood there is no remission. And that which made me the more afraid of this, was, because I had seen some, who, though when they were under the wounds of conscience, would cry and pray, yet seeking rather present ease for their trouble than pardon for their sin. They cared not how they lost their sense of guilt so they get it out of their mind. Now having got off the wrong way, it was not sanctified unto them, but they grew harder and blinder and more wicked after their trouble. This made me afraid, and made me cry to God the more, that it might not be so with me. And now I was sorry that God had made me a man, for I feared I was a reprobate. I counted man, as unconverted, the most doleful of all creatures. Thus being afflicted, and tossed about my sad condition, I counted myself alone, and above the most of men unblessed. Yea, I thought it impossible that ever I should attain to such godliness of heart, as to thank God that he had made me a man. Man, indeed, is the most noble, by creation, of all creatures in the visible world, but by sin he has made himself the most ignoble. The beasts, birds, fishes, etc. I bless their condition, for they had not a sinful nature, they were not obnoxious to the wrath of God, they were not to go to hell after death, I could therefore have rejoiced, had my condition been any of theirs. To this condition I went a great while, but when the comforting time was come, I heard one preach a sermon from these words in Solomon's song, Behold thou art fair, my love, behold thou art fair. But at that time he made these two words, my love, his chief and subject matter from which, after he had a little opened the text, he observed these several conclusions. 1. At the church, and so every saved soul is Christ's love, when loveless. 2. Christ's love without a cause. 3. Christ's love, which hath been hated of the world. 4. Christ's love, when under temptation and under distraction. 5. Christ's love, from first to last. But I got nothing by what he said at present, only when he came to the application of the fourth particular, 
This was the word he said, If it be so, that the saved soul is Christ's love when under temptation and distraction. Then, poor tempted soul, when thou art assaulted, and afflicted with temptations, and the hidings of God's face, yet think on these two words, my love, still. So as I was going home, these two words came again into my thoughts, and I well remember, as they came in, I said thus in my heart, that shall I get by thinking on these two words. This thought had no sooner passed through my heart, but these words began to kindle in my spirit. Thou art my love, thou art my love, twenty times together, and still as they ran through my mind, they waxed stronger and warmer, and began to make me look up. But being as yet between hope and fear, I still replied in my heart, But is it true, but is it true? At which this sentence fell upon me. He wist not that it was true, which was done unto him of the angel. Then I began to give place to the word which with power did over and over make this joyful sound within my soul. Thou art my love, thou art my love, and nothing shall separate thee from my love. And with that M heart was filled with comfort and hope. And now I could believe that my sins would be forgiven me, yea, I was now so taken with the love and mercy of God, that I remember I could not tell how to contain till I got home. I thought I could have spoken of his love, and have told of his mercy to me, even to the very crows that sat upon the ploughed lands before me. Had they been capable to have understood me, wherefore I said in my soul, with much gladness, well, would I had pen and ink here, I would write this down before I go any farther, for surely I shall not forget this forty years hence. But alas, within less than forty days I began to question all again, which made me begin to question all still. Yet still at times I was helped to believe that it was a true manifestation of grace unto my soul, though I had lost much of the life and savor of it. Now about a week or a fortnight after this I was much followed by this scripture, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, and sometimes it would sound so loud within me, yea, and as it were, fall so strongly after me, that once, above all the rest, I turned my head over my shoulder, thinking verily, that some man behind me had called me, being at a great distance, my thought he called so loud. It came, as I have thought since, to have stirred me up to prayer and to watchfulness. It came to acquaint me that a cloud and a storm were coming down upon me, but I understood it not. For about the space of a month after, a very great storm came down upon me, which handled me twenty times worse than all I had met with before. It came stealing upon me, now by one piece, then by another. First, all my comfort was taken from me. Then darkness seized upon me, after which whole floods of blasphemies, both against God and Christ and the scriptures, were poured upon my spirit, to my great confusion and astonishment. These blasphemous thoughts were such as stirred up questions in me against the very being of God, and of his only begotten Son, as whether there were, in truth, a God or Christ, and whether the holy scriptures were. It is not surprising that a man so excitable and ardent as Bunyan, should have had his imagination thus disturbed, by the long continuation of such strong emotion not rather a fable and cunning story than the holy and pure word of God. These things did sink me into very deep despair, for I concluded that such things could not possibly be found amongst them that loved God. Often, when these temptations had been with force upon me, did I compare myself with the case of a child, whom some hath by force taken up in her arms, and is carrying from friend and country. Resist sometimes I did, and also shriek and cry, but yet I was bound in the wings of the temptation, and the wind would carry me away. I thought also of Saul, and of the evil spirit that did possess him, and did greatly fear that my condition was the same with his. In these days, when I have heard others talk of what was the sin against the Holy Ghost, then would the tempter so provoke me to desire to sin that sin, that I was as if I could not, must not, neither should be quiet until I had committed it. Now no sin would serve but that, if it were to be committed by speaking of such a word, then I have been as if my mouth would have spoken that word, whether I would or no. Now again, I beheld the condition of the dog and toad, and counted the estate of everything that God had made far better than this dreadful state of mine, and such as my companions were. Yea, gladly would I have been in the condition of a dog or a horse, for I knew they had no souls to perish under the everlasting weight of hell or sin, as mine was like to do. 
Nay, and though I saw this, felt this, and was broken to pieces with it, yet that which added to my sorrow was, that I could not find that, with all my soul, I did desire deliverance. That scripture did also tear and rend em soul in the midst of these distractions. The wicked are like the troubled sea, which cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace to the wicked, saith my God, and now my heart was, at times, exceeding hard. If I would have given a thousand pounds for a tear, I could not shed one, no nor sometimes scarce desire to shed one. I was much dejected to think that this would be my lot. I saw some could mourn and lament their sin, and others, again, could rejoice and bless God for Christ, and others, again, could quietly talk of and remember with gladness the word of God, while I only was in the storm or tempest. This much sunk me, I thought my condition was alone, I whirled therefore much bewail my hard hap, but get out of, or get rid of these things, I could not. While this temptation lasted, which was about a year, I could attend upon none of the ordinances of God, but with sore and great affliction. In prayer also, I have been greatly troubled at this time, the devil would be continually at me in time of prayer. Have done, break off, make haste, you have prayed enough, and stay no longer, still drawing my mind away. Sometimes, also, he would cast in such wicked thoughts as these, that I must pray to him, or for him, I have thought sometimes of that, fall down, or, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Also, when because I have had wandering thoughts in the time of this duty, I have labored to compose my mind, and fix it upon God, then with great force hath the tempter labored to distract me, and confound me, and to turn away my mind. Yet at times I would have some strong and heart-affecting apprehensions of God, and the reality of the truth of his gospel. But, oh, how would my heart at such times put forth itself in inexpressible groanings? My whole soul was then in every word. I would cry with pangs after God, that he would be merciful unto me. But then I would be daunted again with such conceits as these. I would think that God did mock at these my prayers, saying, and that in the audience of the holy and gels, this poor simple wretch doth hanker after me, as if I had nothing to do with my mercy but to bestow it on such as he. Alas, poor soul, how art thou deceived! It is not for such as thee to have favor with the highest. Then hath the tempter come upon me. Also, with such discouragements as these, you are very hot for mercy, but I will cool you, this frame shall not last always. Many have been as hot as you for a while, but I have quenched their zeal, and with this, such, and such, who were fallen off, would be set before mine eyes. Then I would be afraid that I should do so too. But, thought I, I am glad this comes into my mind. Well, I will watch and take what care I can. Though you do, said Satan, I shall be too hard for you. I will cool you insensibly, by degrees, by little and little. What care I, saith he, though I be seven years in chilling your heart, if I can do it at last. Continued rocking will lull a crying child to sleep, I v, ill ply it close, but I will have my end accomplished. Though you be burning hot at present, I can pull you from this fire, I shall have you cold before it be long. These things brought me into great straits, for as I at present could not find myself fit for present death, so I thought to live long would make me yet more unfit, for time would make me forget all, and wear out even the remembrance of the evil of sin, the worth of heaven, and the need I had of the blood of Christ to wash me, both in mind and thought. But I thank Christ Jesus, these things did not at present make me slack my crying but rather did put me more upon it, like her who met with the adulterer, in which days that was a good word to me, after I had suffered these things a while. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And now I hoped long life would not destroy me, nor make me miss of heaven. I had, also, once a sweet glance from that text. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I remember that one day, as I was sitting in my neighbor's house, and there was very sad at the consideration of my man blasphemy, and as I was saying in my mind, what ground have I to think that I, who have been so vile and abominable, should ever inherit eternal life? 
That word came suddenly upon me. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That also was an help unto me, because I live ye shall live also. But these words were but hints, touches, and short visits, though very sweet when present, only they lasted not. But like to Peter's sheet, of a sudden were caught up from me, to heaven again. But afterwards the Lord did more fully and graciously discover himself unto me, and, indeed, did not only quite deliver me from the guilt that by these things was laid upon my conscience, but also from the very filth thereof. For the temptation was removed, I was put into my right mind again, as other Christians were. I remember one day, as I was traveling into the country and musing on the wickedness and blasphemy of my heart, and considering the enmity that was in me to God, that scripture came into my mind. He hath made peace by the blood of his cross, by which I was made to see, both again and again, that God and my soul were friends by his blood. Yea, I saw that the justice of God and my sinful soul could embrace and kiss each other through his blood. This was a good day to me. I hope I shall never forget it. At another time, as I sat by the fire in my house, and was musing in my wretchedness, the Lord made that also a precious word unto me, forasmuch then as the children are made partakers of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I thought that the glory of these words was then so weighty on me, that I was both once and twice ready to swoon as I sat, yet not with grief and trouble, but with solid joy and peace. At this time, also, I sat under the ministry of holy Mr. Giford, whose doctrine, by God's grace, was much for my stability. This man made it much his business to deliver the people of God from all those hard and unsound tests, that by nature we are prone to. He would bid us take special heed that we took not up any truth upon trust, as from this, or that, or any other man, or men, but cry mightily to God, that he would convince us of the reality thereof, and set us down therein by his own spirit in the holy word. For, said he, if you do otherwise, when temptations come strongly upon you, you not having received them with evidence from heaven, will find you want that help and strength now to resist that once you thought you had. This was as seasonable to my soul as the former and latter rain in their season, for I had found, and that by sad experience, the truth of these is words, for I had felt no man can say, especially when tempted by the devil, that Jesus Christ is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Wherefore I found my soul, through grace, very apt to drink in this doctrine, and to incline to pray to God, that in nothing that pertained to God's glory and my own eternal happiness he would suffer me to be without the confirmation thereof from heaven. For now I saw clearly there was an exceeding difference betwixt the notion of the flesh and blood and the revelation of God in heaven, also a great difference between that faith which is feigned, and according to man's wisdom, and that which comes by a man's being born thereto of God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. But, oh, now, how was my soul led from truth to truth by God, even from the birth and cradle of the Son of God, to his ascension, and second coming from heaven to judge the world? Truly, I then found, upon this account, the great God was very good unto me, for, to my remembrance, there was not anything that I then cried unto God to make known and reveal unto me, but he was pleased to do it for me. I mean, not one part of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, but I was orderly led into it. I saw with great clearness and distinctness the wonderful works of God in giving Jesus Christ to save us, from his conception and birth even to his second coming to judgment, my thought, I was as if I had seen him born, as if I had seen him grow up, as if I had seen him walk through this world, from the cradle to the cross, to which also, when he came, I saw how gently he gave himself to be hanged, and nailed on it for my sins and wicked doings. When I have considered also the truth of his resurrection, and have remembered that word, touch me not, Mary. I have seen as if he had leaped out of the grave's mouth, for joy that he was risen again, and had got the conquest over our dreadful foes, saying, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. I have also in the Spirit seen him, 
on the right hand of God the Father for me, and have seen the manner of his coming from heaven to judge the world with glory, and have been confirmed in these things by these scriptures. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. But he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and said, Behold, I see heaven opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And he commanded us to preach unto the people, and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them who look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I am he that life, and was dead, and behold I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord, in the air, and so shall we be ever with the Lord. Wherefore comfort ye one another with these words. Once I was troubled to know whether the Lord Jesus was man as well as God, and God as well as man, and truly in those days let men say what they would. Unless I had it with evidence from heaven all was nothing to me. I counted myself not set down in any truth of God. Well, I was much troubled about this point, and could not tell how to be resolved. At last that came into my mind, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. In the midst of the throne, thought I, there is the Godhead, in the midst of the elders, there is his manhood. That other scripture also did help me much in this, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It would be too long here to stay, to tell you in particular how God did set me down in all the things of Christ, and how he did, that he might do so, lead me into his words, yea, and how he did open them unto me, and make them shine before me and cause them to dwell with me, talk with me, and comfort me over and over, both of his own being, and the being of his Son, and Spirit, and Word, and Gospel. Only this, as I said before, twill say unto you again, that in general, he was pleased to take this course with me first to suffer me to be afflicted with temptations concerning them, and then reveal them unto me, as sometimes I should lie under great guilt for sin, even crushed to the ground therewith. And then the Lord would show me the death of Christ, yea, so sprinkle my conscience with his blood, that I should find, and that before I was aware, that in that conscience, where but just now did reign and rage the law, even there would rest and abide the peace and love of God, through Christ. Now I had an evidence, as I thought, of my salvation, from heaven, with many golden seals thereon, all hanging in my sight. Now could I remember this manifestation, and the other discovery of grace, with comfort, and would often long and desire that the last day were come, that I might be forever inflamed with the sight, and my communion with him, whose head was crowned with thorns, whose face was spit upon, and body broken, and soul made an offering for my sins. For whereas before, I lay continually trembling at the mouth of hell, now my thought, I was got so far therefrom, that when I looked back, I could scarce discern it. And oh, thought I, that I were fourscore years old now, that I might die quickly, that my soul might be gone to rest. But before I had got thus far out of these my temptations, I did greatly long to see some ancient man's experience who had writ some hundreds of years before I was born. For those who had written our days, I thought, but I desired them now to pardon me, that they had writ only that which others felt, or else had, through the strength of their wits and parts, studied to answer such objections as they perceived others were perplexed with, without going down themselves into the deep. Well, after many such longings in my mind, the God in whose hands are all our days, did cast into my hand, one day, a book of Martin Luther's. It was his comment on the Galatians, it was also so old, that it was ready to fall piece from piece if I did but turn it over. Now I was pleased much that such an old book had fallen into my hands, the which when I had but a little way perused, I found my condition in his experience, so largely and profoundly handled, as if his book had been written out of my heart. This made me marvel, 
For thus thought I, this man could not know anything of the state of Christians now, but must needs write and speak the experience of former days. Besides, he doth most gravely also, in that book, debate of the rise of these temptations, namely, blasphemy, desperation, and the like, showing that the law of Moses, as well as the devil, death, and hell, hath a very great hand therein, the which, at first, was very strange to me, but considering and watching, I found it so indeed. But of particulars here I intend nothing. Only this methinks I must let fall before all men. I do prefer this book of Martin Luther upon the Galatians, excepting the Holy Bible, before all the books that ever I have seen, as most fit for a wounded conscience. And now I found, as I thought, that I loved Christ dearly. Oh, my thought, my soul cleaved unto him, my affections cleaved unto him, but I did quickly find that my great love was but too little, and that I, who had, as I thought, such burning love to Christ, could let him go again for a very trifle, God can tell how to abase us, and can hide pride from man quickly after this my love was tried to purpose. For after the Lord had, in this manner, thus graciously delivered me from this great and sore temptation, and had set me down so sweetly in the faith of his holy gospel, and had given me such strong consolation and blessed evidence, touching my interest in his love, through Christ, the tempter came upon me again. Bunyan then proceeds to relate his various temptations, and the exercises of his mind. Some of these arose from his mistake as to some passages of scripture. But other texts were applied by the Spirit of God, so as to guide his mind aright and, by the painful process through which he was brought, he was peculiarly qualified to succor the tempted and to console the afflicted. For example, he says, I was tempted to sell and part with this most blessed Christ, to exchange him for the things of this life, for anything. The temptation lay upon me for the space of a year, and did follow me so continually, that I was not rid of it one day in the month, no, not sometimes one hour in many months together, unless when I was asleep. Yet it was a continual vexation to me, to think that I should have so much as one thought within me against Jesus, that had done for me as he had done, and yet that I had almost none others, but such blasphemous ones. But it was neither my dislike of the thought, nor yet my desire and endeavor to resist, that did in the least shake or abate the continuation or force and strength thereof, for it did always, in almost whatever I thought, intermix itself therewith, in such sort, that I could neither eat my food, stoop for a pin, chop a stick, or cast mine eye to look on this or that, but still the temptation would come, sell Christ for this, or sell Christ for that, sell him, sell him. One morning, as I did lie in ray bed, I was, as at other times, most fiercely assaulted with this temptation, to sell and part with Christ, the wicked suggestion still running in my mind, sell him, sell him, as fast as man could speak, against which also, in my mind, as at other times, I answered, no, no, not for thousands, 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 at least twenty times together. But at last, after much striving, even until I was most out of breath, I felt this thought pass through my heart, let him go, if he will, and I thought also that I felt my heart freely consent thereto. Oh the diligence of Satan! Oh the desperateness of man's heart! Now was the battle won, and down fell I, as a bird that is shot from the top of a tree, into great guilt and fearful despair. Thus, getting out of my bed, I went into the field, but God knows, with as heavy a heart as mortal man, I think, could bear, when, for the space of two hours, I was like a man bereft of life, and, as now, past all recovery, and bound over to eternal punishment. And without, that scripture did seize upon my soul, or profane person, as Esau, who, for one morsel of meat, sold his birthright, for he know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now was I as one bound, I felt myself shut up as unto the judgment to come. Nothing now, for two years together, would abide with me but damnation and an expectation of damnation. I say nothing now would abide with me but this, save some few moments for relief, as in the sequel you will see. These words were to my soul, like fetters of brass to my legs, in the continual sound of which I went for several months together. But about ten or eleven o'clock one day, as I was walking under a hedge, full of sorrow and guilt, God knows, 
and bemoaning myself for this hard hat, that such a thought should arise within me. Suddenly this sentence rushed in upon me, the blood of Christ remits all guilt. At this I made a stand in my spirit, but that this word took hold upon me, the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now I began to conceive peace in my soul, and my thought, I saw, as if the tempter did steal away from me, as being ashamed of what he had done. At the same time also I had my sin and the blood of Christ thus represented to me, that my sin when compared to the blood of Christ, was no more to it, than this little clod or stone before me, is to this vast and wide field that here I see. This gave me good encouragement for the space of two or three hours, in which time, also, methought, I saw, by faith, the Son of God, as suffering for my sins, but because it tarried not, I therefore sunk in my spirit, under exceeding guilt again. Then, again, being loth and unwilling to perish, I began to compare my sin with others, to see if I could find that any of those who were saved, had done as I had done. So I considered David's adultery and murder and Peter's sin, which he committed in denying his master. Oh, how did my soul prize at this time the preservation that God did set about his people? Ah, how safely did I see them walk, whom God had hedged in. They were within his care, protection, and special providence. Though they were full as bad as I by nature, Yet because he loved them, he would not suffer them to fall without the range of mercy. But as for me, I was gone, I had done it. He would not present me, nor keep me, but suffered me, because I was a reprobate, to fall as I had done. Now did those blessed places that speak of God's keeping his people, shine like the sun before me, though not to comfort me, yet to show me the blessed state and heritage of those whom the Lord had blessed. Now I saw, that as God had his hand in all the providences and dispensations that overtook his elect, so he had his hand in all the temptations that they had to sin against him, not to animate them to wickedness, but to choose their temptations and troubles for them, and also to leave them for a time, to such things only that might not destroy, but humble them, as might not put them beyond, but lay them in the way of the renewing his mercy. But oh! What love, what care, what kindness and mercy did I now see mixing itself with the most severe and dreadful of all God's ways to his people. He would let David, Hezekiah, Solomon, Peter, and others fall, but he would not let them fall into the sin unpardonable, nor into hell for sin. Oh, thought I, these be men that God hath loved, these be the men that God, though he chastiseth them, keeps them in safety by him, and them whom he makes to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But all these thoughts added sorrow, grief, and horror to me, as whatever I now thought on, it was killing to me. If I thought how God kept his own, that was killing to me, if I thought how I was fallen myself, that was killing to me. As all things wrought together for the best, and to do good to them that were called, according to his purpose, so I thought that all things wrought for damage, and for an eternal overthrow. Then, again, I began to compare my sin with the sin of Judas, that, if possible, I might find if mine differed from that, which in truth is unpardonable, and oh, thought I, if it should differ from it, though but the breadth of an hair, what a happy condition is my soul in. And, by considering, I found that Judas did this intentionally, but mine was against prayer and strivings. Besides, his was committed with much deliberation. But mine in a fearful hurry, on a sudden, all this while I was tossed to and fro like the locust, and driven from trouble to sorrow, hearing always the sound of Esau's fall in my ears, and the dreadful consequences thereof I was often now ashamed that I should be like such an ugly man as Judas. I thought, also, how loathsome I should be unto all the saints in the day of judgment, in so much that now I could scarce see a good man that I believed had a good conscience, but I should feel my heart tremble at him while I was in his presence. Oh, now I saw a glory in walking with God, and what a mercy it was to have a good conscience before him. I was at this time tempted to content myself by receiving some false opinions, as that there should be no such thing as a day of judgment, that we should not rise again, and that sin was no such grievous thing. The tempter suggesting thus, for if these things should indeed be true, yet to believe otherwise would yield you ease for the present. If you must perish, never torment yourself so much beforehand. Drive the thoughts of damning out of your mind by possessing your mind with some such conclusions that atheists 
and unbelievers used to help themselves with Al. But, oh, when such thoughts have passed through my heart, how, as it were, within a step, have death and judgment been in my view? My thought the judge stood at the door. I was as if it had come already, so that such things could have no entertainment. But, methinks I see by this, that Satan will use any means to keep the soul from Christ. He loveth not an awakened frame of spirit, security, blindness, darkness and error, is the very kingdom and habitation of the wicked one. I found it hard work now to pray to God, because despair was swallowing me up. I thought I was, as with a tempest, driven away from God. For always, when I cried to God for mercy, this would come in, it is too late, I am lost, God hath let me fall, not to my correction, but to my condemnation. My sin is unpardonable. I know concerning Esau, how, that after he had sold his birthright, he would have inherited the blessing, but was rejected, that saying would sometimes come into my mind, he hath received gifts for the rebellious. The rebellious, thought I, why, surely, they are such as were undare subjection to their prince, even those who, after they have once sworn subjection to his government, have taken up arms against him. And this, thought I, is my very condition, I once loved him, feared him, served him, but now I am a rebel, I have sold him, I have said, let him go if he will, but yet he has gifts for rebels, and then why not for me? This sometimes I thought on, and would labor to take hold thereof, that some, though small refreshment, might have been conceived by me, but in this also I missed of him desire. I was driven with force beyond it. I was like a man going to execution, even by that place where he would fain creep in and hide himself, but may not. After I had considered the sins of the saints in particular, and found mine went beyond them, then I began to think with myself, said the case, I should put all theirs together, and mine alone against them, might I not then find encouragement? For if mine, though bigger than any one, yet should be but equal to all, then there is hope. For that blood that hath virtue enough in it to wash away all theirs, hath virtue enough in it to wash away mine, though this one be as big if not bigger than all theirs. The tempter strongly suggested to me that I ought not to pray to God, for prayer was not for any in my case, neither could it do me good, because I had rejected the Mediator, by whom all prayer came with acceptance to God the Father, and without whom no prayer could come into his presence. Wherefore now to pray, seeing God has cast you off, is the next way to anger and offend him more than ever you did before. Yet my case being desperate, I thought with myself, I can but die, and if it must be so, it shall once be said, that such an one died at the foot of Christ in prayer. This I did, but with great difficulty, God doth know, and that because, together with this, still that saying about Esau would be set at my heart, even like a flaming sword, to keep the way of the tree of life, lest I should take thereof in life. Oh, who knows how hard a thing I found it to come to God in prayer. I did also desire the prayer of the people of God for me, but I feared that God would give them no heart to do it, yea, I trembled in my soul to think that some or other of them would shortly tell me that God hath said those words to them, that he once did say to the prophet concerning the children of Israel, Pray not for this people, for I have rejected them. So, pray not for him, for I have rejected him, yea, I thought he had whispered this to some of them already. Only they durst not tell me so, neither durst I ask them of it. For fear if it should be so, it would make me quite beside myself. Man knows the beginning of sin, says Spira, but who bounds the issues thereof? About this time I took an opportunity to break my mind to an ancient Christian, and told him all my case. I told him, also, that I was afraid that I had sinned the sin against the Holy Ghost, and he told me he thought so too. Here, therefore, I had but cold comfort, but talking a little more with him, I found him, though a good man, a stranger to much combat with the devil. Therefore, I went to God again, as well as I could, for mercy still. Then did that scripture seize upon my soul, he is of one mind and who can turn him. Oh, I saw it was as easy to persuade him to make a new world, a new covenant, or a new Bible, besides that we have already, as to pray for such a thing. This was to persuade him that what he had done already was mere folly, and persuade him to alter, yea, to disannul the whole way of salvation. And then would that saying rend my soul asunder, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
Now the most free and full and gracious words of the gospel were the greatest torment to me. Nothing so afflicted me as the thought of Jesus Christ, the remembrance of a Savior, because I had cast him off, brought forth the villainy of my sin and my loss by it to mind. Nothing did twinge my conscience like this. Everything that I thought of the Lord Jesus, of his grace, love, goodness, kindness, gentleness, meekness, death, blood, promises, and blessed exhortations, comforts and consolations, it went to my soul like a sword. For still unto there my considerations of the Lord Jesus, these thoughts would make place for themselves in my heart. Ah, this is the Lord Jesus, the loving Savior, the Son of God, whom you have parted with, whom you have slighted, despised, and abused. This is the only Savior, the only Redeemer, the only one that could so love sinners as to wash them from their sins in his own most precious blood. But you have no part nor lot in this Jesus. You have put him from you. Now, therefore, you are severed from him. You have severed yourself from him. Behold, then, his goodness, but yourself to be no partaker of it. Though, thought I, what have I lost? What have I parted with? What has disinherited my poor soul? Oh, it is sad to be destroyed by the grace and mercy of God, to have the Lamb, the Savior turn lion and destroyer. I could not think of the wrath of the Lamb, in that great day of his wrath when no rebels to his authority will be able to stand. I also trembled, as I have said, at the sight of the saints of God, especially at those that greatly loved him, and that made it their business to walk continually with him in this world, for they did, both in their words, their carriages, and all their expressions of tenderness, and fear to sin against their precious Savior, condemn and lay guilt upon, and also add continual affliction and shame unto my soul. The dread of them was upon me, and I trembled at God's Samuel's. And Samuel came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Commest thou peaceably. Thus I was always sinking, whatever I did think or do. So one day I walked to a neighboring town, and sat down upon a settle in the street, and fell into a very deep pause about the most fearful state my sin had brought me to, and, after long musing, I lifted up my head. But methought I saw as if the sun that shineth in the heavens did grudge to give light, and as if the very stones in the street and tiles upon the houses did bend themselves against me. My thought, that they all combined together to banish me out of the world. I was abhorred of them, and unfit to dwell among them, or to be partaker of their benefits, because I had sinned against the Savior. Oh how happy now was every creature to what I was! For they stood fast and kept their station, but I was gone and lost. And breaking out in the bitterness of my soul, I said to my soul with a grievous sigh, How can God comfort such a wretch I, I had no sooner said it? But this returned upon me, as an echo doth answer a voice, This sin is not unto death. At which I was as if I had been raised out of the grave, and cried out again, Lord, how couldst thou find out such a word as this? For I was filled with admiration at the fitness and the unexpectedness of the sentence, the fitness of the word, the rightness of the timing of it, the powder and sweetness and light and glory that came with it, also, were marvelous to me to find. I was now, for the time, out of doubt as to that about which I was so much in doubt before. My fears before were that race sins were not pardonable, and so that I had no right to pray, to repent, etc., or that if I did it would be of no advantage or profit to me. But now, thought I, if this sin is not unto death, then it is pardonable, therefore, from this I have encouragement to come to God by Christ for mercy, to consider the promise of forgiveness, as that which stands with open arms to receive me as well as others. This, therefore, was a great easement to my mind, to wit, that my sin was pardonable, that it was not the sin unto death. If any man see his brother in a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that ye shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. None but those that know what my trouble, by their own experience, was, can tell what relief came to my soul by this consideration. It was a release to me from my former bonds, and a shelter from my former storm. I seemed now to stand upon the same ground with other sinners, and to have as good right to the word and prayer as any of them. The next day at evening, 
Being under many fears, I went to seek the Lord, and as I prayed, I cried, and my soul cried to him in these words, With strong cries, O Lord, I beseech thee, show me that thou hast loved me with everlasting love. I had no sooner said it, but with sweetness, this returned upon me as an echo, or sounding again, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Now I went to bed in quiet. Also when I awaked the next morning it was fresh upon my soul, and I believed it. As I was musing and in my studies, considering how to love the Lord, and to express my love to him, that saying come in upon me, if thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who should stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. These were good words to me, especially the latter part thereof, to wit, that there is forgiveness with the Lord, that he might be feared, that is, as I then understood it, that he might be beloved, and had in reverence. For it was thus made out to me, that the great God did set so high an esteem upon the love of his poor creatures, that rather than he would go without their love, he would pardon their transgressions. That saying, and he spake a parable to them, to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, with others, did encourage me to prayer. Then the tempter laid at me very sore, suggesting, that neither the mercy of God, nor yet the blood of Christ, did at all concern me, nor could they help me from my sins, therefore it was in vain to pray. Yet thought I, I will pray. But, said the tempter, your sin is unpardonable. Well, said I, I will pray. It is to no boot, said he. Yet, said I, I will pray. So I went to prayer to God, and while I was at prayer, I uttered words to this effect. Lord, Satan tells me, that neither thy mercy nor Christ's blood is sufficient to save my soul, Lord, shall I honor thee most, by believing that thou wilt and canst, or him, by believing that thou neither wilt nor canst, Lord, I would fain honor thee, by believing thou wilt and canst, and as I was thus before the Lord, that scripture fastened on my heart, O man, great is thy faith. Yet I was not able to believe this, that this was a prayer of faith, till almost six months after, for I could not think that I had faith, or that there should be a word for me, to act faith, therefore I should still be, as in the jaws of desperation, and went mourning up and down in a sad condition. One day, when I was in a meeting of God's people, full of sadness and terror, for my fears again were strong upon me, and as I was now thinking my soul was never the better, but my case most sad and fearful, these words did with great power suddenly break in upon me. My grace is sufficient for thee, my grace is sufficient for thee, my grace is sufficient for thee, three times together. And oh, my thought, that every word was a mighty word unto me, as my and grace and sufficient and for thee, they were then, and sometimes are still, far bigger than others be. That scripture most sweetly visited my soul, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Oh, the comfort that I had from this word, in no wise, as who should say, by no means, for nothing whatever he hath done. But Satan would greatly labor to pull this promise from me, telling me that Christ did not mean me in such as I but sinners of a lower rank that had not done as I had done. But I would answer him again, Satan, here is in these words no such exception, but him that comes, him, any him, him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out, and this I well remember still, that of all the slights that Satan used to take this scripture from me, yet he never did so much as put this question, but do you come aright? And I have thought that the reason was, because he thought I knew full well what coming aright was, for I saw that to come aright, was to come as I was, a vile and ungodly sinner, and to cast myself at the feet of mercy, condemning myself for sin. If ever Satan and I did strive for any word of God in all my life, it was for this good word of Christ, he at one end and I at the other. Oh, what work we made! It was not this in John, I say, that we did so tug and strive, he pulled and I pulled, but God be praised, I overcame him, I got sweetness from it. One day as I was passing into the field, and that too with some dashes of my conscience, fearing lest all was not right yet, suddenly this sentence fell upon my soul, thy righteousness is in heaven, and my thought, without, I saw with the eyes of my soul. Jesus Christ at God's right hand, there, I say, was my righteousness, so that wherever I was, or whatever I was doing, God could not say of me, he wants my righteousness, for that was just before him. 
I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse, for my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions. And irons, my temptations also fled away, so that from that time those dreadful scriptures of God left off to trouble me, now when I also home rejoicing, for the grace and love of God. So when I came home, I looked to see if I could find that sentence, Thy righteousness is in heaven, but could not find such a saying, wherefore my heart began to sink again. Only that was brought to my remembrance, he is made unto us of God, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. By this word I saw the other sentence true. For by this scripture I saw that the man Christ Jesus, as he is distinct from us, as touching his bodily presence, so he is our righteousness and sanctification before God. Here, therefore, I lived, for some time, very sweetly at peace with God through Christ. Oh, my thought, Christ, Christ, there was nothing but Christ before my eyes. I was not now only for looking upon this and the other benefits of Christ apart, as of his blood, burial, or resurrection, but considering him as a whole, as he in whom all these, and all other his virtues, relations, offices, and operations met together, and that he sat on the right hand of God in heaven. It was glorious to me to see his exaltation and the worth and prevalency of all his benefits, and that because now I could look from myself to him, and would reckon that all those graces of God that now were green on me, were yet but like those wretched goats and fourpence halfpennies that rich men carry in their purses, when their gold is in their trunk at home. Oh, I saw my gold was in my trunk at home, in Christ my Lord and Saviour. Now Christ was all, all my righteousness, all my sanctification, and all my redemption, Further, the Lord did also lead me into the mystery of union with the Son of God, that I was joined to him, that I was flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. And now was that word of St. Paul sweet to me. By this also was my faith in him, as my righteousness, the more confirmed in me. For if he and I were one, then his righteousness was mine, his merits mine, his victory also mine. Now could I see myself in heaven and earth at once, in heaven by my Christ, by my head, by righteousness and life, though on earth by my body or person. Now I saw Christ Jesus was looked upon of God, and should also be looked upon by us, as that common or public person, in whom all the whole body of his elect are our ways to be considered and reckoned, that we fulfilled the law by him, died by him, rose from the dead by him, got the victory over sin, death, the devil, and hell by him, when he died we died, and so of his resurrection. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise, saith he. And again, after two days he will revive us, and the third day we shall live in his sight, which is now fulfilled by the sitting down of the Son of Man on the right hand of the Majesty in the heavens. A.C. According to that of the Ephesians, he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ah. Uh. These blessed considerations and scriptures, with many others of like nature, were in those days made to spangle in mine eyes, so that I have cause to say, Praise ye the Lord God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness. Having thus in a few words given you a taste of the sorrow and affliction that my soul went under, by the guilt and terror that these my wicked thoughts did lay me under, and having given you also a touch of my deliverance therefrom, and the sweet and blessed comfort that I met with afterwards, which comfort dwelt about a twelve month with my heart, to my unspeakable admiration. I will now, God willing, before I proceed any farther, give you in a word or two, what, as I conceive, was the cause of this temptation, and also after that, what advantage, at the last, it became unto my soul. For the causes, I conceive they were principally two, of which two also I was deeply convinced all the time this trouble lay upon me. The first was, for that I did not, when Jay was delivered from the temptation that went before, still pray to God to keep me from the temptations that were to come. 
For though, as I can say in truth, my soul was much in prayer before this trial seized me, yet then I prayed only, or at the most, principally, for the removal of present troubles, and for fresh discoveries of his love in Christ, which I saw afterwards was not enough to do. I also should have prayed that the great God would keep me from the evil that was to come. Of this I was made deeply sensible by the prayer of Holy David who when he was under present mercy, yet prayed that God would hold him back from sin and temptation to come. For then saith he, Shall I be upright, and then I shall be innocent from the great transgression. By this very word was I galled and condemned quite through this long temptation. That was also another word that did much condemn me for my folly, in the neglect of this duty. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This I had not done, and therefore was thus suffered to sin and fall, according to what is written, Pray that ye enter not into temptation, and truly this very thing is to this day of such weight and awe upon me, that I dare not, when I come before the Lord, go off my knees, until I entreat him for help and mercy against the temptations that are to come. And I do beseech thee, reader, that thou learn to beware of my negligence, by the afflictions that for this thing I did for days and months and years with sorrow undergo. And now, to show you something of the advantages that I also have gained by this temptation. And first, by this I was made continually to possess in my soul a very wonderful sense both of the blessing and glory of God, and of his beloved Son. In the temptation that went before, my soul was perplexed with unbelief, blasphemy and hardness of heart, questions about the being of God, Christ, and the truth of the word, and certainty of the world to come, I say then I was greatly assaulted and tormented with atheism. But now the case was otherwise. Now was God and Christ continually before my face, though not in a way of comfort, but in a way of exceeding dread and terror. The glory of the holiness of God did at this time break me to pieces, and the tenderness and compassion of Christ did break me as on a wheel, for I could not consider him but as a lost and rejected Christ, the remembrance of which was the continual breaking of my bones. The scriptures also were wonderful things unto me. I saw that the truth and verity of them were the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Those that the scriptures favor, they must inherit bliss. But those that they oppose and condemn must perish forevermore. Oh, this word, for the scriptures cannot be broken, would rend the call of my heart. And so would that other, whose sins be remit, they are remitted. But whose sins ye retain, they are retained. Now I saw the apostles to be the elders of the city of refuge. Those that they were to receive in, were received to life, but those that they shut out, were to be slain by the avenger of blood. By this temptation I was made to see more into the nature of the promises than ever I had before. For I, lying now trembling under the mighty hand of God, continually torn and rent by the thundering of his justice, this made me with careful heart and watchful eye, with great fearfulness to turn over every leaf, and with much diligence, mixed with trembling, to consider every sentence, together with its natural force and latitude. By this temptation also I was greatly holden off from my former foolish practice of putting by the word of promise when it came into my mind. For now, though I could not seek that comfort and sweetness from the premise as I had done at other times, yet like to a man sinking, I would catch at all I saw. Formerly I thought I might not meddle with the promise, unless I felt its comfort, but now it was no time thus to do, the avenger of blood too hard by did pursue me. Now therefore was I glad to catch at that word, which yet I feared I had no ground or right to own, and even to leap into the bosom of that promise that yet I feared did shut his heart against me. Now also I would labor to take the word, as God hath laid it down without restraining the natural force of one syllable thereof, oh, what did I see in that blessed sixth chapter of sin? John, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now I began to consider with myself that God had a bigger mouth to speak with than I had a heart to conceive with. I thought also with myself that he spake not his words in haste, or in an unadvised heat, but with infinite wisdom and judgment, and in very truth and faithfulness. I would in these days, even in my greatest agonies often flounder towards the promise, as the horses do towards sound ground, that yet stick in the mire, concluding, though as one bereft of his wits through fear, on this will I rest and stay, and leave the fulfilling of it to the God of heaven that made it. Oh, many a pull hath my heart had with Satan, 
For that blessed sixth chapter of John, I did not now, as at other times, look principally for comfort, though, oh how welcome would it have been unto me. But now a word, a word to lean my weary soul upon, that it might not sink forever. It was that I hunted for. Yea, often when I have been making to the promise, I have seen as if the Lord would refuse my soul forever, I was often as if I had run upon the pikes, and as if the Lord had thrust at me, to keep me from him, as with a flaming sword. Then would I think of Esther, who went to petition to the king, contrary to the law, so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to law, and if I perish, I perish. I thought also of ben servants, who went with ropes on their heads to their enemies for mercy. The woman of Canaan, also, that would not be daunted, though called dog by Christ, and the man that went to borrow bread at midnight, were also great encouragements to me. I never saw those heights and depths and grace, and love and mercy as I saw after this temptation, great sins to draw out great grace, and where guilt is most terrible and fierce, there the mercy of God in Christ, when showed to the soul, appears most high and mighty, when Job had passed through his captivity. He had twice as much as he had before. Blessed be God for Jesus Christ our Lord. Many other things I might here make observation of, but I would here be brief, and therefore shall at this time omit them, and do pray God that my harms may make others fear to offend, lest they also be made to bear the iron yoke as I did. We may here remark upon these records of Bunyan's experience, that God works in different ways in bringing souls home to himself. The conversion of John Bunyan or any other eminent saint, must never be regarded as the model to which all must, in this particular, be conformed. Some are drawn by the still voice of mercy, and others are driven by the terrors of the Lord from sin to holiness. But no terrors, no texts powerfully impressed on the mind, nor any extraordinary intimation of the Spirit, can be substituted for a change of the heart, nor should they be regarded as any proof of such a change, if sin be not hated, and forsaken, and Christ and holiness be not supremely loved. Genuine repentance for sin, constant faith in Christ, and obedience to his laws, are the best evidences of being converted to God. Bunyan's mind was at length happily freed from its embarrassments, and he enjoyed much pleasure in the ways of God. He speaks of possessing in his soul delightful views of the glory of God and the excellencies of Christ. God reconciled in Christ Jesus was continually before his face. The scriptures appeared to him a very wonderful book. On their truth he placed entire confidence, and by their application to his mind he was instructed in the way of life. Still there was great ignorance, frequently discovered of the true meaning of the sacred volume. And hence there were many passages grossly misapplied to himself, as comparing his case to Esau's, when he was seeking pardon from God who had promised to forgive. But Esau only sought to alter his father's purpose respecting his birthright, which was irrevocably fixed. This it was, also, which led him to make the doctrines of election an objection to his applying to Jesus Christ for salvation as the gospel nowhere directs sinners to scrutinize the secret purposes of God, but exhorts them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and promises that whosoever believes in him shall be saved with an everlasting salvation. Most gladly would we enrich the present compilation, with further extracts from the life of this extraordinary man, but our limits forbid, having seen him just ready to perish in the city of destruction, and witnessed his flight from it, amid the scoffs and jeers of his wicked companions, having followed him through the slough of despond, and over the wide and desolate plain, up to the wicked gate, and thence to the cross where his burden fell off from his back. We can only glance at his subsequent progress, as he goes on through perils and deliverances, towards the delectable mountains and the celestial city. In his twenty-fifth year, Bunyan became a member of the Baptist Church in Bedford, and three years after, in 1656, began to preach the everlasting gospel. He entered into the work with all his heart and soul, and as might have been expected, his labors were crowned with signal success. Having struggled so long in the horrible pit in the miry clay, himself, he knew better than most ministers how to address those who were in similar circumstances. 
having been so often driven almost to despair by various temptations. He was eminently qualified, in humble imitation of his divine master, to succor them that were tempted. But it was not to be expected that the great adversary, who had so terribly buffeted him both before and after his conversion, would now permit him to proceed without further molestation. The fires of persecution were about to be rekindled, and it would have been next to miraculous if he had not been scorched by them. Soon after the restoration of Charles II, the flame broke out, and Bunyan was sent to prison because he could not conscientiously conform to the arbitrary dictation of the ecclesiastical courts. When they commanded him to conform or keep silence, all his answers were in the very spirit of the apostles. Whether we ought to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. It was about the 1st of November 1660 that he was committed to Bedford Jail, there to await his trial at quarter session in January. When the trial came on, he was treated with great indignity and contempt by some of the court, which he endured with the spirit of a martyr. He was finally condemned for upholding of unlawful assemblies, conventicles, etc., and remained in prison for about 12 years. But it was impossible to fetter the bold and inventive energies of his mind, or to quench his holy zeal. Though his body was in confinement, the word of God was not bound. God sent him to prison as he did Joseph into Egypt, to do more for the church than he would have accomplished in any other way. Till this event, he was so fully employed in the support of his family, and in constant preaching, that it was impossible he could ever have written anything without a change in his circumstances. But by these means, he was effectually called away from mending pots and kettles, as the apostles were from mending their nets, and however painful the dispensation was to himself, his family and his friends, it afforded him probably the best opportunity he could have had both by his example and writings, to strengthen the faith and animate the hopes of believers to the end of time. It was during his imprisonment that he conceived and wrote that wonderful allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress, besides the Holy War, and many other things in his own inimitable style and manner. It is hardly necessary to add that the first mentioned of these works has been translated into almost all the modern European languages and next to the Bible is one of the most popular books in the world. Soon after Bunyan's enlargement, in 1672, his friends built him a meeting house in Bedford where he continued to preach till his death which took place on the 12th of August, 1688. His last sickness he bore, with much constancy and patience, and expressed himself as if he desired nothing more than to be dissolved and be with Christ, which is far better. Finding his vital strength decay, having also settled his mind and his affairs, as well as the shortness of the time and the violence of the disease would permit, with a constant and Christian patience, he resigned his soul into the hands of his most merciful Redeemer, following his pilgrim from the city of destruction to the new Jerusalem. The following epitaph marks the place where his body rests in hope of a glorious resurrection. The pilgrim's progress now is finished, and death has laid him in his earthly bed.